Good morning, Woodland, and welcome to our live stream service today. We are so glad that you've decided to worship with us. And before you do anything else, will you make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel or like us on Facebook? That way you'll be notified every time we go online for our services. And also, we'd love it if you would just simply write a comment. Let us know who's watching today as well. Now, in just a few moments, I'm going to be praying over our offering, but I want to share with you just a couple ways that you can give today. The first way is by simply texting to give by texting the keyword Woodland Church. That's one word, Woodland Church, to the number 77977. Another way to give is through our website at woodland.church. You can also give through our Woodland Church app. And if you haven't downloaded our app, I want to encourage you to go to either the App Store or the Google Play Store and download it by searching Woodland Church Mobile. And you can use our app if you've got multiple devices today to uh, take notes as well. And you can look through it and see so many other different things as well. And so I want to encourage you, make sure you download it today. Also, you can write a check and mail it to the church as well. Now, I also want to remind all our kids today to join us online at 1130 for our Timber Ridge Live on our Facebook page as well. Now, will you join with me in prayer today? Father, I thank you so much, God, that we get to worship you. And I pray right now, Lord, may you come and may you minister to your people. Lord, as we open up our hearts and lift our voices to you today, God, may you fill our homes with your presence. And may you touch us and change us into, your, into the image of, you, of who you want us to be. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will you join with me this morning as we worship?
good morning, and thank you for uh, being here with us today, for just tuning in and, and listening to us. And would you please join me as we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you with joyful hearts this morning, hearts full of praise and full of gratitude, Lord, for your love and your peace and your grace. Lord, without those, our lives would really be confusing. But God, you give us that peace that takes away that confusion. You give us that grace to Heavenly Father that we can walk in moment by moment. And we thank you for that this morning. Lord, your word said that we are to bring our request to you. And Lord, we do. Lord, we pray for a country that's in confusion right now. We pray for a country to Heavenly Father that needs peace. So Lord, we pray and we ask in the name of Jesus, would your peace overrule the confusion that's going on today? Would your peace overrule the Heavenly Father, the trouble that's going on today, just not in our nation, but across the world? And Lord, this morning also, we thank you, God, that you are the God that heals, that you are the God, the Heavenly Father, that is concerned about each and every one of us. So, Lord, this morning, we pray for those that maybe right now can't even pray for themselves. God, we pray that you would touch and that you would heal. Lord, those in the hospital, Lord, would you touch and would you heal. Those, the Heavenly Father, this morning that are home and are suffering from maybe cancer, heart disease, knees, backs, just a lot of things. That's, Lord, suffering even from confusion this morning and don't know what to do and how to do it. God, we pray for a healing in those lives this morning. Meet each and every one of them, Lord, where they're at. Where they're at, Heavenly Father, in their spiritual life. Where they're at, Heavenly Father, in their physical life and in their mental life. God, may there be victory in the name of Jesus this morning as they yield to you, and as you touch and you heal. Now, Lord, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word, the Heavenly Father, that's powerful. Your word, the Heavenly Father, that speaks to each and every one of us. So we pray this morning as Pastor brings that word that you've laid upon his heart just for us this morning. We pray, God, that we would be doers, just not listeners, but doers of your word this morning. We ask it in your precious and holy name. Amen. Good morning and happy Father's Day. I am so thankful to be able to come and share with you today a message that I've entitled, Becoming a Friend of God. On this Father's Day, I want to give a big shout out to all the dads that are raising and nurturing their children to know and to love and to serve God. All of those times that you spend with your children, teaching them the scripture, praying with them at night before they go to bed, I'm telling you, Dad, that makes a huge difference in their life. They need to learn from their mom, and they need to learn from you as well what it means to be a passionate follower of Christ. As a matter of fact, they learn some things from you that they'll never learn from their mom about a relationship with God. And moms, they'll, your children will learn things from you they'll never learn from their dad about a relationship with God. And by the way, if you're a childless couple, if you're a grandfather or a grandmother, you can always befriend a young person and you can always love them and attempt to disciple them. Don't let there be any excuses why you can't point a child to God. And on this Father's Day as well, I want to give a big shout out to my dad who is in heaven and to Becky's father who is in heaven. I am so grateful for their examples. I'm so grateful for their love. I am so grateful for the legacy of faith that they have left us. And although I hope that on day for me when I go to be with the Lord in heaven is a long ways away because I'm enjoying my children and my grandchildren, I do hope to leave a strong legacy of faith for them. You know, one of the questions that I'm often asked by people sometimes is, why is God angry? Why is God angry at the world? Why is God angry at me? Well, <clears throat> I think we need to probably address that before I get into the Scripture this morning because I think we have misunderstood the anger of God 
sometimes because of the fault of the way some Christians have tried to explain it, and sometimes by the fault of the world, and sometimes with not really just being familiar with what the Bible says. Let's look together at a passage of Scripture from James chapter 2 and verse 23. The Bible says that Abraham believed God, and God counted him righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. Look at that. He was even called the friend of God. Well, if you know anything about Abraham, the life of Abraham, you know he was far from a flawless man. You know he was far from the perfect father. You know that he was very far from the perfect husband. However, Abraham believed and he trusted God, and because he believed and trusted God, God called him his friend. And I'd like to look at that today because I want to be a friend of God. There was a song that was sang here at Woodland one time by one of the groups here at the church, and the lyrics go something like this, Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me, it is amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Friends, I want you to know today God loves you. God wants to do something wonderful in your life. And dads, particularly you today, God wants to touch you and God wants to be your friend and for you to be his friend. This verse so fascinated me that earlier this week I was out exercising and as I was walking through our subdivision and praying and thinking, I remembered in my Bible college days, I was going to summer school. I was in a, <clears throat> a room without any air conditioning in Lakeland, Florida in the summertime. And I had a fan blowing over me while I was having my morning devotions. And I came across this phrase that Abraham was called the friend of God. And I highlighted that. I still have that Bible from my Bible college days, and I went back, and I can see where I highlighted it, and I dated it, and I began going through the Bible and just marking all of the places about friendship with God. It's been something I've always wanted, and I'm far from a perfect man. I'm far from a flawless man. I'm far from the perfect dad or the perfect husband, but I want to tell you this. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God, and He calls me his friend today. You see, I think what happens sometimes is people misunderstand the anger of God. As a father, I've gotten angry. As a pastor, I've gotten angry. As a husband, I've gotten angry. And so have you. I'm sure that all of us have had those occasions when we get angry. angry. But God's anger is not malice. God's anger is not vindictive. God's anger is not intent on hurting you. As a dad, I got angry. I was snow skiing <clears throat> in the North Carolina mountains one time, and I got a call. Someone had hurt my son. A grown person had hurt my son and done something he should have never done. And I was on top of that mountain. I skied flawlessly down that mountain, being up on a black diamond run, because my anger took over me to protect my child. And I remember when I got to the bottom, there were people to meet me because everything in me, my child was hurt. It wasn't malice. I wanted to protect my child. And the security met me, and, and some of the friends that I was skiing with met me and says, the man is gone. He's been sent away. We advised him it was best for him to leave because we knew you would be angry. Well, friends, there was nothing in my heart to go and, and, and kill him or to do him evil or anything like that. I would have liked to have seen him punished and the, the law have taken him away rather than them giving him a chance to get away. But the reason being is not just for the protection of my son, but to see that this person never did that again to any child. And by the way, I just thought of this, so I should probably say it. It's not in my manuscript. It was not anything like sexual abuse or anything like that that unfortunately we read so much about today. But here's the deal that we have to understand. God's malice is not angry. Look at this passage from Exodus chapter 4 and verse 14. The Lord became angry with Moses. The Lord became angry with Moses. Now, friends, we know that God loved Moses. 
We know that Moses, like Abraham, walked with God. We know that the Bible says that God spoke with Moses face to face as a friend. When I go to the Capitol and I go into the House of Representatives, I always look up because there is a motif of Moses that the President of the United States has to look straight at while he's giving the State of the Union address because Moses' portrait or his motif is in that Capitol building and is right in the President's line or the Speaker's line of sight as they speak. Moses, though, because he doubted God, Moses, because he questioned God, God became angry with him. Not because God was going to harm Moses, but because God wanted Moses to trust him. God wanted Moses to follow him. God wanted to to take and deliver the children of Israel through Moses. Well, there are times that you might become angry with someone because you believe an employee or your employer is capable of, of doing better for his employees or doing better uh, by you as an employee. There are times when you may get angry with your children because you know they're capable of doing better. If your child is, a, is an A student and brings home C's, you're not going to be very happy about that. If your child is a, is, a, is a D student and brings home a C, you're going to be very happy about that because you see the child trying. C.S. Lewis said these words in a book called Letters to Malcolm, chiefly about prayer. He said, anger is the fluid that bleeds when it's cut. Anger is the fluid that love bleeds when it's cut. And beloved, because God loves us, there are times that I'm, I'm sure that each of us make God angry. There have been times when I have felt God's displeasure in my life. Sometimes it's been conviction. Sometimes it's been fear where I've not been willing to step out in faith and to trust Him. But because God loves me and because He's my friend, He doesn't give up on me. Now, you see, we think about anger too often in the way that anger happens in the world. Matter of fact, we've all seen people in road rage and they uh, run somebody off the road. Or sometimes we read these tragic stories about road rage where somebody becomes so out of control and angry, they pull a gun and they'll shoot somebody on the highway. A few years ago, I was driving through Detroit and somebody could not get around me and they were and, and I couldn't get over to let them around me. And they were just pointing like they were shooting a gun at me. And I, I know they were saying all kinds of choice words. And finally, when I got over, even though I couldn't get over, this person is just, just takes his eyes off the road. And he's just letting me have you know what as he's flying by. <clears throat> the Bible tells us it's okay to get angry. If your child is bringing home D's when they're capable of C's, or if your child is bringing home C's when they're capable of A's, it's okay to be angry. You want to bring the best out of them. But the Bible says, don't let, excuse me, don't sin by letting anger control you. And friends, God's anger never controls him. And because of the grace of God in our lives, we are not controlled by anger. We are not motivated by anger. We are motivated by love. And let me show you something else tonight. God shows his friendship to me by giving his life for me. Over to my left, there's a large cross. And I love that cross because it's a reminder to me of what God has done for me. When we have prayer service here at the church, occasionally I'll see people slip over and just kneel at the foot of the cross as they're praying. There's not a crucifix. We don't have Jesus hanging on the cross, although there's nothing wrong with that. The cross is empty because Christ rose from the dead, and we want to keep that in front of everybody. But we never want to forget the price that God paid for us. God gave his life for you. God gave his life for me. God became a man. God became Jesus, and he died for your sins, and he died for my sins upon the cross. It's that beautiful doctrine of the incarnation that we talk about. It's that beautiful doctrine that we celebrate at Christmas when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. It's that song we sing, joy to the world, the Lord is come, let earth receive her king. We rejoice and we celebrate the birth of Jesus and how that God somehow or another supernaturally came to give his life for us. 
In John chapter 15 and 13, Jesus said, there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. God showed his love in laying down his life. And he did it, notice for what he said, not for sinners. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where Jesus ever called anybody a sinner. But I can find plenty of places where he had some harsh words to say to people like me. I can find plenty of places where he had some harsh words to say to his church when they were not growing in faith and they became lukewarm in their faith. But Jesus is calling the lost people. He's saying, you're my friends. It's why I'm coming. I love you. And so, is God angry at sin? Absolutely. Does God get angry at us when we disobey? Absolutely, because he knows that we can do better. But God is not, does not have any malice towards us at all. God gave his life for us. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 10 with me. Our friendship with God, excuse me, our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, has made us friends of God. You know, if you've got this up on your app or you've downloaded the outline or maybe you've got your Bible open, circle that phrase right there, friends of God. Jesus has made us friends of God. I mean, this is a proof of friendship that God was willing to lay down his life for us. On that Palm Sunday years ago, Dad, when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Perhaps you remember that as a, as a child when you were going to church. Or perhaps you remember the stories of that from a Bible story book like my parents read to us as children and we read to our children of how Jesus came riding in on the back of a donkey and people were waving palm branches saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus was riding into town knowing he's going to lay down his life for you, knowing he's going to lay down his life for me, knowing he's going to lay down his life that for whosoever would believe in him and trust him the way Abraham trusted God, the way Moses trusted God, that if you and I trust in what Jesus did for us at Calvary, that we would be saved. Friends, he's saying to you, I'm your friend. Now, can I just kind of be blunt here for just a moment? Sometimes we know who our friends are because of what they're willing to do for us. Let me say it again. Sometimes we know who our friends are because of what they're willing to do for us. And I know that sounds rather crass or rather blunt, but let me see if I can illustrate it like this. I have all kinds of, quote, friends on Facebook. You have all kinds of, quote, friends on Facebook. But I can tell you right now that if I need some of those friends to show up at midnight because I don't have food for guests, if I need some of those friends to show up at midnight because I run out of car, uh, gas in my car, they're not going to be anywhere close by. But the friend is the one that I can pick up my phone and I can hit the speed dial to my friend and say, hey, could you come and help me? I've run out of gas, I've got a flat tire, or I need some food. I've had some unexpected guests, and the grocery store is closed during the COVID virus, perhaps. And that person that is my friend says, of course. And the person who is not my friend says, what are you doing calling me? Why are you calling me? No, we know a friend because of what a friend is willing to do for us. You know, I'm a member of a number of organizations but I can tell you, I have acquaintances in those organizations. It takes time to build a friendship. And you and I calculate our friendships based upon the fact, are people willing to give up part of their life to help us, to come alongside of us? The next thing I want you to see tonight, the third thing I want you to see, is that God shows his friendship to me by confiding in me. God shows his friendship to you by confiding in you. Trust is a wonderful thing, and I've often said that trust brings the best out of me. Trust brings the best out of you. When people trust us, it just makes us want to do better in life because we're being trusted. And when God says he trusts us and he confides in us, well, I got to tell you, that just makes me, it just makes me want to serve the Lord all that much better. Every single day I get up, I go, Lord, I want to serve you better today than I did yesterday. I want to love you better today than I did yesterday. 
Becky and I, when we, when we were youth pastors, we used to lead our youth group in a song that says, I want to love you more, much more than I did yesterday. I want to serve you more, much more than I did yesterday. Learn to seek your face and the knowledge of your grace. I want to love you. I want to seek you. I want to know you. Those were the lyrics to a wonderful course. Matter of fact, I may ask Pastor Mark to resurrect that course all the way back from the 70s by a group called Hosanna. It was just a wonderful little course that taught our students to how to seek the Lord and to love the Lord and to know the Lord. But you know that you have a friend when they're willing to confide in you. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 15. I no longer call you slaves because a master does not confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Say that with me. Now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You know, I want to be your friend. I sincerely do. It's why I want to tell you what God has said to you. Whether you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian, I want to be your friend because God has confided in me through His Word. God has confided in you through His Word. We've been given the Bible so we can know the mind of God, the heart of God, the thoughts of God, and He has confided in us. And you know that it's a mark of friendship when somebody says to you, I trust you. I want to share this with you. You see, you know somebody's not your friend when you don't want them to know secrets, when you don't want them to know the deepest closest parts of you. As a matter of fact, you know somebody is not your friend when they walk into a circle of conversation and because you know you can't trust them, immediately you stop talking because you can't confide in them. And we've all met those people that we can't confide in. We've all met those people we can't trust in. Now, my kids have all told me, Dad, when we are going to have a baby, you're the last person we're going to tell what the baby's name is, because you can't keep a secret when it comes to your joy about grandchildren. As a matter of fact, let me say that again, I believe that my my son, my oldest son, had to rename one of his children because in all of my excitement, I called out his name and talking to people in a church on a Sunday morning. Well, sometimes it's not because people have ill intent, but because they get so excited. And you say to that friend, I'm going to tell you something, but you've got to promise you're not going to tell anybody. Well, here's the good news. Jesus doesn't tell us to keep quiet. Jesus doesn't keep tell us to keep silent. He tells us, shout it from the rooftop. Share it with everybody. Each day, the book of Psalms says, tell someone that he saves Friends, God has confided in us the best news of all, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and He wants us to share. Now, let me say something else about this, because sometimes people are are nice people. People are good people, and you just don't know, can I share this good news with you? Matter of fact, you're not sure how to approach it, and so because you haven't learned to confide in them yet, you start trying to build a relationship. So maybe, just maybe, you begin to build that relationship and then sooner or later you realize you're willing to confide a little bit in them. Now, how do you know that you've found somebody you can confide in? Well, I'm going to give you a real easy secret. You know that you've found somebody that you can confide in because when you see them, There's something about your life that lights up. When you see them, there's something about your life. You're just eager to talk to them. You know, if somebody walks into Starbucks that you don't know and you're reading a newspaper, or excuse me, somebody walks into Starbucks that you do know, but you really don't want to have a conversation with them, if you read a newspaper, you'll pick that paper up in front of you like they do in the movies, and you hide behind that paper. And you just hope that they don't come over and interrupt you or they are, want to sit down and have a conversation because you're doing something else. But if your best friend walks into that Starbucks and you see your best friend, the first thing you do is you go, hey, Steve, hi, Alan. You, you want to talk to that person because they've walked into the restaurant and you don't care who hears you. You just 
call out their name, and hopefully they want to talk to you as well. But you know there's somebody you want to confide in. You know, when Becky walks into a room, everything stops. When my wife walks into a room, I don't care who, everything stops. I want to talk to her. I'm eager to see her. It doesn't matter what meeting I'm in. I've always told my children, and even though they're grown, if you need me, you call me. I will take the call because you need me. I love you. I'm excited to talk to you. And you know, I'm so thankful. Nearly every day I hear from my kids and I get to talk to them. They'll call me and we'll chat. Now, the older ones now, uh, I can say to all of them, if I'm in a meeting now, I just have a little message I tap and say, hey, I'm in a meeting, but if this is urgent, call me right back. I love you, Dad. It just, boom, it goes up. Matter of fact, I may have accidentally sent that message to you from time to time. But here's the deal. I'm excited to hear from my children, and I confide in them, and they confide in me. And have you ever thought God wants to do the same thing with you? That's the reason that when God adopted you as his son or daughter on your confession of faith that Jesus said you could pray not heavenly father not almighty God it is okay to pray that way but you say our father which art in heaven our father God loves you and God wants to share with you all the secrets of his wonderful book the Bible and he puts his Holy Spirit in you to help you grow now the next thing I'd like you to see dad is I show my friendship with God by loving the way Jesus loved. I show my friendship with God by loving the way Jesus loved. And you say, well, it's impossible for me to love like Jesus loved. Jesus was flawless. Jesus was perfect. Our statement of faith says that Jesus lived a sinless life. He lived a perfect life. Well, of course Jesus was flawless, and I'm not flawless. However, I'm growing in grace, and as you follow Christ, you will grow in grace as well, Dad. You will grow in grace as well, Mom. To become a friend of God, young person, you grow in grace. And this is what Jesus says. He says, this is my command, love each other. And the verse goes on to say, I love you, Lord. Or you, I love you, Lord, excuse me. I love you, Lord, and I want to love you the way you have loved me. You see, that's another proof of friendship. Friends that love each other. Friends that say, whatever it takes, we're going to work together. We're going to build together. And Jesus says, whatever it takes, I'm going to build. So sometimes you might become angry with a friend, but you don't give up on the friend. Sometimes you might become angry with your child, but you mean no malice and you don't give up on that child. But you learn to forgive, and when you forgive, you don't bring it back up. You know, love holds no record of wrongs. Some of the marriage counseling that I do, what happens is, is the couples keep going over the same things over and over and over again. They've never forgiven each other. Oh, they've said the words, I forgive you, but they've never really forgiven you say, Pastor, how do you know that? Because the Bible says, love holds no record of wrong. Now, because I'm not a flawless man, if Becky ever calls my hand on something, you know, I might have all these things come up in my mind that I could say back, but love will not do that. Love will not bring up anything that she may have done wrong. Love will not bring up any past hurts or pains because once you deal with them and you forgive, you forget you forgive and you restore if restoration is necessary. You forgive and you rebuild trust if trust is, rebuilding trust is necessary. But you don't keep bringing the same thing back up again. And Jesus is saying to us, don't miss this commandment. Love one another. Let me go back to another song back in the 70s where we used to sing, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. See, friends, loving the way Jesus loved, being Jesus' friend and loving Him means that I love others as well, and I love the way that God loved me. You know, Becky and I love to watch a TV series uh, on television it's called NCIS, and I bet you've watched that before. NCIS is about a, 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 a um, naval investigative service, 
And in that service, there's this man called Gibbs. You know, Gibbs has got a lot of flaws, but he's a very strong man. He's a very loyal man. He's a good man. In the, in the TV show, you just you can't help but really like and respect the, the, the way Gibbs lives his life and the way he pursues those that are criminals, but the way he treats his team. And you can almost tell that when he smacks Denozo on the back of the head or when he smacks McGee on the back of the head, when he does that, you can tell it's almost a term of endearment. It's almost an affectionate display because he believes in them and he's smacking them on the back of the head because he knows they can do better. He knows they can think better. He knows they can process better. Now, I'm not recommending you go out today and smack your friends on the back of the head but what I'm saying is, despite all of Gibbs' flaws, you see that Gibbs is a man that cares deeply, loves deeply. In all of the episodes that Becky and I have watched through the years, one of the words that keeps coming up about Gibbs and his team is their family. Their family. Their family. And beloved, tonight I want you to know this is one of the ways that Jesus says that you and I can show him that we love him and that's by loving others. And then the fifth thing I'd like you to see today is I show my friendship with God by confiding in God. I show my friendship with God by praying and talking to God, sharing what's on my heart. God has shared with me, you know, His thoughts in the Bible. God shares with us sometimes through impressions of the Holy Spirit, but when's the last time you really sat down and you poured your heart out to God? The book of Psalms is full of examples of how that David just poured his heart out to the Lord and loved him. Now, I discovered something in working through these passages and preparing for this, this message. And that is the Hebrew idea of intercession from the Old Testament. The Hebrew idea of intercession is this. It means to think things through with God. Think things through with God. Don't let that get by you. In the book of Isaiah, God says to his people, he says, come, let us reason together. Let us think through this thing together. Let's talk with one another. Let's reason through this thing together that though your sins be like scarlet, they shall become as white as wool. Beloved, what's he saying? When we pray, intercessory prayer, and we do that here at Woodland every Saturday night for one hour, six to seven. We did it last night on a, on a Facebook Live because we're not able to gather here in the sanctuary yet. But we did it last night on Facebook Live. We interceded. What we're doing is we're thinking things through with God. We're talking to God about these issues. So let's say I'm praying for someone with cancer. I just confide in the Lord God, this is the problem. This is what your word says. This is what we see. Maybe I'm praying with a parent that has a rebellious teenager, and I say, Lord, you gave them this child. I had the privilege of dedicating this child to the Lord. When they were a baby, the parents brought them here, and I took the baby and lifted it up in my arms, and I dedicated it, and the parents committed to raising that child in the knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And now this child has wandered away. Lord, why? What's going on in that child's life? What does your word have to say about this? And God sometimes gives me direction or guidance, or he gives the parents direction or guidance. He gives us his word. God's confiding in us, but I'm confiding in God. And I could go on with example after example like that. Years and years ago, before our first son was born, when Becky and I were so, we were married for 10 years before our first son was born, there were many times for a vacation or for a weekend getaway when all I would do is I would sit with Becky and just let her talk to me about her desire to be her mother, the loneliness in her heart, her desire. Our love for each other was so intense that we wanted to share that love with someone. And there were just so many times, even in the evenings, for out of the blue, something would come up. And I remember in particular one Mother's Day, we were youth pastors and wonderful, loving church, and we were celebrating Mother's Day, and we went home that afternoon after we had dinner with a family in our church that had invited us over for Mother's Day, and we sat on my sofa, and I listened to my, our sofa, and I listened to my wife just weep 
and I held her because she so desperately wanted to be a mother. She'd talk those things through with God. She'd pray about those things. She confided in God. God confided in her. God confided in us. As a matter of fact, he gave us several scriptural promises. And I will never forget one night, Becky woke me up. And she says, honey, we've got to get up. We've got to pray. God is going to give us a baby. And we rolled out of the bed. We hit our knees together. We claimed that promise from the Lord. We once more poured out our hearts to God. We went over those promises from the Bible that God had given us. Four children, three grandchildren later, I'm here to tell you, I am so glad we thought things through with God. Look at John chapter 15 and verse 16 with me. You didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father, look, so the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. What is one of the proofs of friendship? It's that I think things through with God. It's I confide in God. I become an intercessory prayer warrior, and I ask for the things that God wants to bless you with. I ask for the things God wants to bless this congregation with. I ask for the things that God wants to bless my family with, for our community and our nation. I prove that I'm a friend of God by confiding and asking God in the name of Jesus Christ for what the Lord wants. And more than anything, God wants you to be his friend today. God has showed you his friendship by laying down his life for you. God has showed you his friendship by calling you his friend. God has showed you his friendship by confiding in you. And today I am asking you, would you today begin to build a friendship with the Lord? Would you make it your point? Would you make it a point in your life that you want to grow? Would you make God your number one friend? You know, He is my Lord. He is my master. I kneel before Him every day. So when I use this word friend with God, don't think for one moment I'm being flippant. Don't think for one moment I, <clears throat> I would come up and punch Jesus on the shoulder and say, how you doing, buddy? I'm sure if I, when I get to see the Lord, I'm going to bow at His feet. But I know that He is my friend, and I know He wants to be my friend. Look at what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 8. Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. The most important relationship in your life is not your marriage. The most important relationship in your life is not your children. The most important relationship in your life is not the church. The most important relationship in your life is God. Having that friendship with God through Jesus Christ, His Son, coming to Him in faith and accepting what He did for you at Calvary. He laid down His life for you so that you could be saved. Number two, Make time to be still and to be silent. Make time to just be still and be silent. You know, when I'm with friends, I don't answer my phone. When I'm with friends, I put it on silent. Now, if my children call, like I said earlier, if my wife calls, I'll say, I need you to excuse me unless I, if they call me back and I send that message to them. But with friends, sometimes just quiet. We're just there together. The fact that we're making a road trip together, the fact that we're hiking together, the fact that we're playing golf together doesn't mean that we've got to be talking all the time. But you've got to take time to be still and to be silent. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Friends, in your busy schedule, and I know you're busy, and all the demands upon your time, and I know there are a lot of demands upon your time. There's a lot of demands upon my time. But it's so important every morning to get up and spend time with God before you go to work. Even if it's just a few, maybe you're not a morning person, but get up for just a few minutes and just be still before the Lord and say, Lord, I want to know you better today than I did yesterday. I want to serve you better today than I did yesterday. Lord, I want to learn to seek your face and the knowledge of your grace. When you take that time to be still and to be silent, you will begin to grow.
And it will make a difference in your day. It will make a difference in your relationships because you spent time with the Lord. And then finally, make up your mind to know God more fully. Make up your mind. In most of life, when we make up our minds to do something, we do it. You say to your child, if you'll make up your mind, you can pass this test. You say to your child, if you make up your mind, you can earn the scholarship. You see, a lot of times it's just making up our mind. Wednesday night, Becky and I were teaching from the book of 2 Peter, and I talked about that growth was possible. I talked about growth was necessary, that growth is organic. We talked about how that growth not only is, is, is possible, organic, and necessary, but growth is visible. You watch your children become smarter. You watch your children become more skilled. You watch your child learn to throw a baseball or learn to walk. When I was disabled growing up, my parents celebrated every little thing I did. Things my sisters could do before I did, but they celebrated every little thing I did because they saw progress being made. You see, God knows who you are. You're not wired like me. I'm not wired like you. But we both have the same Holy Spirit living within us if we've committed our lives to Jesus. And if we make up our, our minds that we want to know God, we can know Him. The Bible says, when you seek for me with all of your heart, you'll find me. When you seek for me with all of your heart, you'll find me. Let me give you two illustrations of that before I read this verse of Scripture. I came back from studying in Israel, and our son, our firstborn, we didn't, our second son wasn't born yet. Our first son was sitting in a stroller <clears throat> with his mother, and I had been gone for quite a while. I was so excited to see him, and when he, I was afraid while I was gone. I remember talking to a friend of mine in Israel and said, I'm just so afraid he's going to forget me while I'm gone, but when I walked in when I walked off the plane and in those days you could still come to the gate when he saw me he began jumping up and down and bouncing in his stroller he was so happy to see me I grabbed his mom first and hugged her and then I grabbed him up and I hugged him as well you see when you love somebody you just get excited when you get to see them another story I just like to tell you is when I see my wife, it doesn't matter where I'm at, I'm going to grab her, I'm going to embrace her, I'm going to kiss her. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1 and verse 10. I will continually long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully. I will continue long to know the wonders of Jesus more fully and to experience the overflowing power of His resurrection working in me. Oh, my friends, today... Don't ever let this pass you by. There's more of Jesus to know. As the old hymn says, Oh, tell me more, more about Jesus. More of His grace, more of His goodness, more of His mercy. There's more to know and to learn about our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't committed your life to the Lord yet, Dad, the greatest gift you can give to your family is to give them, give your heart to Jesus Christ and give them the peace of knowing that you know God. Mom, the greatest gift you can give to your family is to give your heart to Jesus and give them the peace of knowing that you know God. You'll be transformed. You'll be changed. If you'll join me right back here on Facebook Wednesday night, Becky and I are going to be talking about that, how God transforms us in our, our Bible study. But you see, you'll become a new person. So many times I've had people to tell me, I've got a new husband, I've got a new wife. Kids have told me, I've got a new dad. Why? Because when they accepted what Christ did for them, when they accepted that Jesus laid down his life for them, something miraculous happened in their lives, and it was called being born again. So I invite you today, dad, mom, teenager, child, I'm asking you, Give your heart to Jesus Christ. Would you join me in prayer right now? And just repeat this after me. And if you mean it from the bottom of your heart, I'm telling you, God looks more at your heart than he does your words. Say, dear Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for laying down your life for me. Thank you for confiding in me. Thank you for being my friend. I trust what Jesus did at Calvary for me. Because of his death and resurrection, I can have forgiveness of all my sins. And I can become a brand new person. I ask you, transform me. And from this day forward, Lord, I want to be your friend. I want to live for you. I want to lay down my life for your glory. And I want to confide in you. So would you help me to grow, to know you better? Would you help me to grow in grace? God, would you help me to make time to be still each and every day? in your presence, for I make up my mind today to become a passionate follower of Christ. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Now don't go anywhere. You just prayed that prayer with me. Tomorrow I want to send you a gift. If you will just let me know that you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, that you prayed with me, I've got a gift. I want to help you get started to get to know the Lord. You know, if you will just simply send us a text or you can reply on Facebook or YouTube. I think you can reply on YouTube, but if not, if you'll just send us a text or an email to office at woodland.church, tomorrow I'll be putting in the mail some things to help you grow in your faith. Or if you just share your email, I'll follow up with an email to you tomorrow to help you grow in your faith. And by the way, if you've just committed your life to Jesus, friends, We've got all kinds of ways here at Woodland Church to help you grow. In addition to this service that we're providing online right now for you, we've met today with two wonderful services right here on the campus. We're meeting outside right now, and I invite you to come and join us next Sunday. And, you know, we're asking right now for people to sign up because we're going to observe what the governor has asked and, and limit attendance so we can protect everybody. But I would love to personally invite you to come visit Woodland Church. I would love to personally get to meet you and get to know you as well. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and make you prosperous and productive in everything you do for his glory and honor. God bless you. Well, family, we're so glad you were with us today. And happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. And Absolutely. Have a wonderful Father's Day. We're, we hope that you have a great day with your family, your kids. Your presents have been in the garage for like a week. so. Yeah, I'm looking forward to going home and opening them today. I hope you have a good screwdriver and pair of pliers. Then I'm not looking forward to going <laughs> home to open them today. I'll wait till they come home. Hey, we just want to remind you that there are still activities going on around Woodland. There's uh, things for the children online. There's Timber Ridge online on the kids Woodland Kids page. Uh, if you prayed that prayer today and gave your heart, committed your life to Jesus Christ, we want to send you a gift this Absolutely. week. Absolutely. We'd like to send you this new Believer's Packet, and this is one of the best examples of a Bible for new Christians and for those of you that have been serving the Lord for a long time. I have enjoyed reading every article and every help in this Bible, and it's, it's, a, it's just the New Testament, but it's entitled, How to Find God. And we've talked about being a friend of God today, and I encourage you to write us, email us, text us, or something We've given away so many of these to people to help them get started in their There's life. There's some good questions yeah. and answers and scriptures you can go in and read about questions that we yeah. all ask from time to time. So You know, there was one lady here that um, she gave her heart to Christ here at Woodland, and then she took her Bible and gave it to her brother who was not a Christian. He had never read the Bible before. And he sat down and read the whole thing in the first week. Blew his sister away. She came back <laughs> wanting another one. But he read the whole thing. I promise you, you'll really, really enjoy this. So jump online. Go to Woodland Church, uh, Woodland Church, Woodland Church, at our website. And just drop us a note or send an email to uh, office at Woodland Church. Woodland and Church. I know, I'm forgetting the dot. Woodland Church. 
And we will send this out to you this week. You know, you do this so well. <laughs> you do this real good. Hey, also, could I ask you to help us today? Join with us in bringing your tithes, your offerings to the Lord. You know, you can pick up your iPhone. I just gave our tithes, sweetheart, um, by typing in 77977 and then one word, Woodland Church. When I say one word, it's just Woodland Church, no space between Woodland and Church. Woodland Church, and within less than five seconds, I had given and gotten a receipt for my giving. And by the way, you can get our app as well just by going to the App Store, or when you give, there's a link directly to the App Store to get our app, whether you're on Google or whether you're on or Android, I think is how they say it, <laughs> Android or whether you're on an Apple phone. But join us today and help us and give towards missions, our benevolence, our youth ministries, our children's ministries, our world missions. We feed children around the world. We help sponsor hospitals. We help sponsor radio ministries. We help sponsor all of our missionaries that, that depend upon us for monthly support. And then, of course, the ministries of our church right here in this community. Woodland is at work 24-7 somewhere in the world today, every single day. You know what? You grew up knowing how to tithe, didn't you? I did. My parents taught us how to tithe. And I just thought maybe on Father's Day, I'd like to give a shout out to my dad for teaching me how to give a penny from every dime, how to give a dime from every dollar to give that to the Lord. And I felt so proud sitting beside my dad in church when he would write out his check, put it in a tithing envelope, and then give me a tithing envelope. And I can remember when I would put a penny in there and I'd put my name there on that envelope, I felt like a grown man. We have seen some envelopes come through with a nickel and a dime and a penny. <laughs> There's two little munchkins in this church, and they'll know who I'm talking about if their parents are listening. Every Sunday morning after church, they go to their mama's purse, they get two dollars out and they put it in a tithing envelope <laughs> and they bring it to me with their name scribbled. I love it. it. <laughs> I do too. We love them. Hey, God bless you. Thanks so much for joining us today.